Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of The Week Web, where we look at the past week's cybersecurity scares, villainous vulnerabilities, and anything else that I just think is kind of interesting, but completely off topic. But anyhow, this week on The Week Web, hackers know your grandma's every move, and Script Kitty gets caught running botnet. But first, and this might sound scary, but, but don't panic. Half of Android handsets susceptible to clever SMS phishing attack. Now, this exploit was made possible by a little known tool called over the air provisioning. But what is over the air provisioning? Well, it's used by cellular networks such as AT&T and EE, such that when a new mobile phone joins the network, the cell carrier has to send a bunch of settings to the device before it can do anything on the network, like MMS message server, mail server, browser homepage settings, all this needs to be sent to the device. And they use over the air provisioning to do this. The idea is, is that you'll get a message on your phone saying new network settings are available from your carrier. You tap yes and you're done. It's pretty standard and not many people question the legitimacy of these messages. You just tap yes and you're done. Well, it turns out that this method of updating a device's settings is pretty feeble. You see, there's almost no authentication between a device and a cell carrier, which means almost anyone can send these over the air provisioning messages to a phone. So why is this a problem and how can it be exploited? Well, threat post reports, in a hypothetical attack, an adversary would send an OMACP message via specialized equipment, which includes a GSM modem that could cost as little as $10. Next, the attacker sends a specially crafted binary SMS message to either a specific target or a range of phone numbers. Now, if you're gullible to accept that message, then you're in for a bad time. In one attack scenario involving a Samsung phone, researchers created an OMACP message that, if accepted by the user, would route internet traffic through a proxy of the researcher's choosing. And by that they mean they'd be able to snoop all of your internet traffic. All of it. So what kinds of phones are susceptible to this attack? Well, it only affects Android phones. In particular, Samsung phones are vulnerable to this without any kind of authentication whatsoever. When it comes to other phones, like Huawei, LG, or Sony phones, they require you to know a specific phone's IMSI number before you can send one of these messages to it. Now, an IMSI number is similar to an IP address. Every single mobile phone, every device has an IMSI number unique to it. However, unfortunately, these IMSI numbers are really easy to find. Almost a third of Android apps released within the last three years have access to this IMSI number. It's a really common permission for an app to have. So a rogue app or data breach could leave you vulnerable. There's good news though, there's good news. This attack vector was reported to handset makers this March, and so far Samsung and LG have released fixes. Huawei is releasing a fix with their new line of phones. However, however, Sony, Sony refused to acknowledge the vulnerability, stating that their devices follow the Open Mobile Alliance client provisioning OMA CP specification, wrote researchers. And that's just a long-winded way of saying that they just don't see this as a problem and thus refuse to fix it. Now, I think this is a bit pathetic. It doesn't matter whether you're compliant with specification or not. If there's a vulnerability, well, then there's a vulnerability and it, the onus is on you to fix it. I reckon with a bit of public pressure, they probably will cave that or Sony face the embarrassment of this being used in the wild against phones they make. Now, a small word from our sponsor, me. Uh, if you're not aware, Maltronics.com is a site I own and run. It sells a whole host of hobbyist hacker hardware, from Wi-Fi keyloggers to bad USBs and Wi-Fi deauthors. Do check it out. I'll have it linked below, Maltronics.com. Next up, if you search GPS tracker on Amazon, eBay, wherever, you'll find a lot of these cheap, tacky-looking things. People use them for tracking the kids, their dog, their car, grandma, well, a vast research is this week reveals that they're cheap and tacky looking for a very good reason. It's a warning that they're about as insecure as a newly launched cryptocurrency. So these devices cost between $25 and $50 usually. They're pretty small and many of them have microphones. The idea is, is that you stick a 2G SIM card in these devices and the device itself will communicate with a cloud server and then you interface with the cloud server via an app. You can see where the device has been, where it is now. As I say, a lot of these devices have onboard microphones, so a lot of the time they actually allow you to listen in to what is happening around the device itself. 
So given what these devices are used for, I reckon it's pretty paramount that they stay secure. It's, it's, it's not the kind of thing that you want hacked. Well, Ars Technica this week reported an estimated 600,000 of these GPS trackers contain vulnerabilities that open users to a whole host of creepy attacks. Specifically, we're talking about the T8 mini tracker here, but there's a load of other models that are affected. There's a list on their website. I'll link it below. You can see if a tracker you have is affected. So it turns out that each of these devices has exactly the same default password, 123456. Would you have guessed it? So all you need to log into the device and see where it's been, where it is now, all of that, all you need is that password and the device's ID. So you know the password, obviously, and the ID itself is derived from the device's IMEI number. So all you have to do is brute force all the IMEI numbers, which actually doesn't take all that long. You brute force all of those, and then you have access to all of those trackers, which are still using the default password. And the vast researchers, of course, did just this and found 231,000 devices with the default password still set. 167,000 of these were trackable. The others presumably were just not in use anymore or they had run out of battery or something. And here's another kicker. The app that you use to control the device transmits everything in plain text. So it's completely open to hackers who are on the same network as you to set up a man in the middle. And the vast researchers, in their diligence, did exactly this. Once their man in the middle was set up, they were able to send a text message from the tracker to a phone they control. And of course, by sending that text message, they knew what phone number the tracker had. And once they had the phone number, they could send an SMS message that sets the new IP address and port of a cloud server and reroutes all the traffic from the tracker to your server of choice. All of this can be done remotely allowing an attacker to see the full movements of anyone with the device. So the full article on Avast's website is a very interesting read. I recommend it. I will link it in the description. Next up, the guy at the center of the Satori botnet has pleaded guilty. Now, I know there's a lot of botnets out there, though this isn't a generic botnet story. It's interesting for a couple of reasons. Firstly, Kenneth Shookman, otherwise known as Nexus Zeta, because if there's anything that's going to strike fear into the hearts of your enemies, it's the pseudonym of a 13-year-old Minecrafter. Anyhow, he is, or he was, the owner of this botnet. Though it turns out he didn't know anything about hacking, programming, or anything at all. He was a total script kitty. So how did he set up this botnet, which, by the way, commanded 100 gigabits per second of traffic, and at its peak actually commanded, or rather he claimed it commanded, a terabit per second of traffic. Now, according to Cloudflare, the world's largest DDoS attack was 1.3 terabits per second. So this Satori botnet is not insignificant. Well, in his quest to become the latest of hackers, he joined hack forums in 2015, as you do. In one post, he pleaded, hello, I'm looking for someone to help me compile the Mirai botnet. I heard all you have to do is compile it and you have access to one terabit per second. So please help me set up a Mirai telnet botnet. Embarrassing. Ouch. Oof. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. So the Mirai botnet, if you're not familiar, was an IoT-based botnet. It took advantage of default passwords, insecurity cameras, DVRs, networking gear, etc. It also exploited a few other vulnerabilities, uh, if I'm correct. Now, if you're unfamiliar, IoT devices are notorious for awful security. Absolutely awful security. They're well known for it. Though the source code for this botnet was leaked a few years ago, it's available on GitHub, it's public, anyone can use it, can modify it, put your own spell on it, set up your own botnet, though I would advise against that. Don't, that, that, that's an awful idea. Don't become, a, don't become this guy. My notes here also say that the Mirai botnet was named after an anime. So if you're into that kind of thing, that's, that's cool, I guess. If you want a full video on the Mirai botnet, let me know. It's pretty interesting for many reasons. It opens up the whole Pandora's box of IoT security and eloquently explains why it's absolutely trash. Anyway, he finally got this botnet up and running, presumably with the help of some compassionate Hack Forum members, and he started up his own DDoS for hire service. And it transpires that the botnet was primarily being used to cripple the servers of various online games, as well as attacking a gaming server provider, Nuclear Fallout. Though nothing lasts forever, and eventually he was tracked down and indicted in August 2018. Though this didn't stop this pillock from persevering. You see, what's the logical thing to do when you're potentially looking at 
years in prison. Well, later that year, Shookman had a brief falling out with his co-conspirator, Drake, and would eventually call a police SWAT on his former buddy, a move that resulted in a substantial law enforcement response showing up at the ex-pal's home. Surprise, surprise. Well, the saga continues and he's due to be sentenced on November 21st, so I'm going to watch this and see if anything new, anything interesting comes out of it. Anyhow, I hope you enjoyed this installment of The Week Web. If you have any suggestions, any ideas for future topics, even for non-news related stuff, please do let me know. And you also notice I have this wall behind me, rather plain looking wall. I'm looking for ideas, what I should do with that. I've considered buying a bunch of scrap motherboards and just sticking those on the wall. I think that would be that would be pretty cool. Or maybe get some cool abstract posters. Maybe that could work. If you have any ideas at all, let me know down in those comments. And as always, stay tuned for more hacking videos. Have a good one.